Uh, we'll take a look how we can take wildlife and do something great with it, extend it to add some new subsystem, new functionalities, for instance, new deployment types. Uh, you want to have your application that has some special handlers that would like you, you to, to use our awesome CLI management tools to manage some special aspect of your application and how the deployment goes, for, for instance. And that's the way to do the extensions. This doesn't have to do anything to like any standards that exist out there. There is no uh, AGBC there. This is just pure internals how the application server is done. How you plug into the back, uh, the management backbone, how to write that standalone XML, how this stuff is done, how the CLI works and things like that. Uh, basically, we'll take a look what are extensions, what Wildlife Core is, which is a new thing we shipped with it. Uh, how to write a simple extension and then I'll show how to write a bit more complex extension, uh, but still simple enough just to get you all started and of course some demo. Please, we are a small crowd, so just ask me whatever you want, stop me whenever you want. If there is something that really looks odd, especially when we get to the code, ask me, no problem. I'll try to answer if really if possible. So, basically, what are extensions? There are basic extension points for everything in the Wi-Fi. Every subsystem you see, like AGB support, JCI support, data sources, mail, everything is an extension. The bare bones stuff is just management and class loading, service layer, and so on. So we do everything with extensions. We have like 20, 25 extensions or subsystems. There's like a small difference between an extension and a subsystem, basically because one extension can provide many subsystems, but we only have one use case of that. So just a big, big, bit of a difference. Uh, and every extension could do, just have like new deployment types, you want to deploy a bar file, <laughs> something, I don't know, or beer file that will know how to deploy a keg of beer, I don't know. Uh, and you can register it and so to react to some special extension or to react to some special deployment marker. This is what, what you can do. Uh, it can provide some new services that can be available to all deployments or just management services that can enable you to better manage the server, some extra stuff like to collect extra operating system capabilities that we don't provide yet and things like that. The model, we'll talk about this a bit later. Then, why I'm talking about Wildfly Core here is because Wildfly Core is basically the Wildfly without all extensions. It's just what it is, the core small part that you can take and write your own application server basically on top of it if you want. You don't want any EE, e e is bad, today is not cool, that many things people say, yeah, no, no, you say Wildfly, no, we don't like EE. E. It's not EE, e, you know, it can be EE if you want. For instance, we have a good cases for Torbox, you know Torbox, e Newton. This Torbox is a Ruby on Rails framework implemented in Java that can use application server features, but has nothing to do with EE. What they took, uh, previously they took a 7 and strip out all the modules and subsystems that didn't need it. So we said, okay, why don't you take the core and add what you need, not just to remove and rip out the stuff. And that was probably, everyone said, oh, it's so big, you have so much, uh, uh, it's 150 megabytes. No, I don't like that. I want to have like 15, maybe 10 megabytes. So Wi-Fi core was born. There was a lot of discussion uh, about it, how to do it, why to do it, is it good or is it not good. I was pushing for it for a year. But basically, I had this slide in my presentation in Boston in June, and three weeks ago we decided to split the code base to have actually the Wildfly Core special code base. So, with Wildfly 9, we'll have like special code base with the Wildfly Core and Wildfly EE with the E components and some more distributions. But on the end, it will look the same. Just the code base will be properly split, so people won't say, "Yeah, Wildfly is E, that's yuck." So, basically, Wildfly Core is has the, the whole class loading stuff, the JBoss model that you all love, uh, the uh, model of service controller, we have domain management, the CLI, REST. Uh, there is no uh, admin console, you can add it on, it's not a problem, but we don't ship it because the admin console is 20 megabytes. A lot of JavaScript, all the browsers optimized and so on. So if it's a backbone and you want to have your custom administration console, add it, it's not a problem. It just one module, you put it there and it works. There is a deployment manager 
that doesn't mean that you can handle any deployments. That just means you have capability to say deploy in your file or upload a deployment, but it won't know what to do with that because there is no deployment processor. It won't know if you deploy a var, it won't do anything unless you add an extension that will know what to do with that thing. Uh, but it's the basic infrastructure to write this deployer, deployment processor and so on. And there is logging, which is, which is the only subsystem we include because it's a bit special. It's not really a subsystem, but it is. So we can talk about this a little bit. Um, the, it's really small, and I'm not just saying that. And I can prove you one thing: is that okay? Let me just okay. We released it today, and as you can see, it's final. It's fancy, and here we have also the uh, core distribution. So you can download today, you can play with it, it will boot, but it won't do anything. So You can connect with the CLI to it, you can deploy also domain management stuff works, so you can actually have the domain deployment and manage all the servers, but it's not useful beyond that. It's basically mean, mean, meant just for people like you that want to write extensions and do everything with them and have your own really cool servers. So that's his what I call. Jibos models, who doesn't know what they are? Who had, who had problems with them, with Jibos models? Everyone loves model class loader. Whoa, great. That's really nice. It's basically the, uh, our idea how model class loader should be implemented. It's, there, there are many ideas in Java how to add that, the proper model class loader, and super packages, and OSGI, and so on. There are so many ideas how to do that. And uh, the guy that actually wrote this, David, on our team, uh, he was actively involved in the whole the certification and JSRs and how to do that. And he basically did that as a proof of concept <coughs> and showed people that it can be done, it can be done easily, and it works well and it works really fast. Uh, yeah, one thing here I forgot to add is a concurrent class loader, so we can actually load classes concurrently in all the, the threads you have in your CPU, because today there are multi uh, core CPUs and it's better to do that. Um, and it's completely isolated, and many people really don't like that when they first used AS7. It's like, why does, does my model see that or that? Yeah, because you don't say you want to see that. You know, it's not obvious that you'll see everything. And one of the main reasons why AS7 and uh, Y8 now is so fast when it comes to booting, deploying, and everything is probably JVS modules. Because it really knows where to look for the class and how to load it. It's not like 150 or 200 megabytes of jar and like, oh, let's open everything and see, yeah, we might find it. That was a big issue with, for instance, uh, AS5 and 6 used the uh, uh, MC. Kabir knows it very well. Uh, he wrote some parts of it. So that thing is what the guys call like a big uh, ball of mud when you were class lo where we're loading. You know, you're looking the resource, and then it's, is it in your application, is it in the var, in here, or in deployments, or is there in the deployers, or in the lib, or the common lib, and then you don't know which is the precedence, which one to load first, and why. And, oh, there are so many issues, but some, many people like that because you know, oh, I have just my 20 jars, I just drop it there and every application will see it. It's a great in theory, but in practice it just causes more problems that it solves. So you can still do that, but a bit differently. One module is not one jar. You know, for instance, you have Hibernate module, work Hibernate, and there are like five jars there, or 10 for what I care. You could even do, for people that want to have like global models, you can say, org my company, all my dependencies, and put 50 jars there. We don't, we don't mind, but you know, have it isolated. Have as much isolation as you want, or don't have it at all. Domain management, who played with all that? Who like, see, okay, Kabir, you wrote half of it, come on. <laughs> He's our rock star when it comes to that. Um, domain management in general is everything that comes with the CLI management, but the CLI is just the client. The domain management part is the, the backbone of that. And the CLI, the HTTP manager, the admin console, they're just some clients that use that infrastructure. And one thing that people really don't believe us is that, you know, XML that you see, 
is we don't really like it. You know? People tend to like it. And that XML is just some persistent state of the domain management configuration. What our parsers actually do, we'll take a look a bit later, is just load that XML and create a set of operations to generate that model. And on the end, when something changes the model, we write that back. That's what extensions do. So you could run the server without any XML, without all that, and it would still run. But we have XML because people like it. Quick question. Sure. Is there any preference between CLI or the, the rest of the space? No. Sorry, I, I just sort of, I've written some of the CLI scripts to configure more. Yeah, the thing is that CLI adds a bit more uh, user friendly features yeah. on top of that, like okay. if else, yeah. like start batch and so on. Like that uh, begin batch, end batch stuff is just like uh, be behind the screens is transforms and like com composite operations and so on. It's a bit more user friendly. Yeah. It does code completion for you and all that stuff. Yeah. Okay, the, the tab completion. It's really useful when it comes to that. Okay. Uh, but basically, you can use any. Change. Yeah, okay. it's really, really yours. Okay. Thanks. <clears throat> yes, you can do. You can do that. <laughs> yeah. Should I promote you? And I'll do a promotion. Yeah, Okay. Okay. Kabir just <laughs> volunteered to present audit logging of the management operations in Wildfly as a lightning talk a bit later. So, you heard about audit logging at all? That's a new feature we added in Wildfly 8, ADA P6.2 for everyone that uses the commercial version. Uh, it enables you to have like a audit log of all the operations that happened in the management API or either with C or through CLI, HTTP, admin console, or whatever. So you, you, you have a trace what is going on. <laughs> That's not going to say you will. You will. <laughs> just sit up with blame then, really. Basically, yeah. Oh. But I should uh, let Kabir yes. explain everything, because he that's his baby, really. Uh, so yeah, basically, DMR clients that we have, DMR, you heard about that before. That is... The types model representation. Yeah, I have that somewhere there, yeah. It's a bit like JSON, but not JSON. And many people complain, why not JSON if you are so close? JSON has so many issues, and the biggest issue in our case was that, uh, uh, how to say it properly, the type safety. type safety and accuracy was the problem, you know, you could find a number like 1, and on the end, on the other side, you won't know if that 1 is int, byte, long, you know, and that, that's a big issue when it goes, especially when you have doubles, floats, and things like that. Uh, and basically our difference is the format is almost the same, but we add like one L, so you know that that's uh, long. Plus we added some special version of the protocol that is binary, stream, stream binary protocol, so it's much faster when it goes to communication. And this DMR is everything that goes around. All operations are DMR based, uh, even the communication between the domain controller and host controllers, they manage everything. It's, DMR based. What you do in CLI is DMR based. It's DMR basically. <laughs> so when you do like read resource, you get a re response back. And because it's really interchangeable with JSON, when you use the uh, REST API, you can just add one parameter and say, okay, I want JSON, and you'll get JSON. If you post accept uh, application JSON, you'll get JSON back. So it's really interchangeable. We don't mind. It's just basically our bit enhanced version of JSON. It's nothing really so different than that. And it's a D type that's the biggest thing. It, it doesn't have defined model, but it's defined on the other uh, other layer, which is why the writing of the extension and resource and models is a bit tricky. Uh, MSC, everyone heard about that. Like when it boots up, it said, start at 350 from 570 services. And that is the MSC service controller telling you how many services or optional services and dependencies were started during the boot of the server. And many people then ask, but every time I deploy something different, there's a different number there. Uh, why when I start a blank server, there are like 170 services when I deploy my application is different. 
Basically, when the application is being deployed, we take stuff out and we look at it, depends what kind of application it is. And some components require like runtime services, so we can do like, uh, I think the AGB injection is done that way, so we can do like dependencies between the AGBs and things like that. That's directly on top of the MSC. Yeah? MSC is a concurrent service controller that allows to boot services concurrently and so on. It's a, basically the life cycle part of the whole server. Then we get to the tricky part, the domain model. This is, the uh, domain model is what you see when you do when you go to CLI and say CD subsystem equals JSF. Uh, JMX, and you do, and then you do CD and another subfolder, and so on. And when you do LS or read resource, it will tell you what what resources and attributes are present. So that is our model definition. It can have attributes, uh, resources, and resources can be registered like dynamically. To, to have some special addressing pod, like a single target. You can say like configuration equals G, 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 GSP for another <coughs> subsystem, for instance. Or you can say uh, configuration, what, what we have like multi-target subsystem equals something, which is the dynamic uh, uh, registration. Because module options for adjusting module. <laughs> for instance, yeah. <laughs> or yeah, login module is one of them. Yeah, login module, uh, name at, name at, name at. And then when you, when you read it, it's like, uh, and you're uh, listing through it is uh, secure, uh, subsystem equals security, login module equals name, slash, and attributes of that login module. And part of the domain definition, we also have the support for multi language descriptions for every attribute and so on. Basically, to be fair, we don't ship the, all the translation in Wildfly, we do in EAP. But if you want to contribute to translations, I think it's easy to do. Really, it's not. We are not hiding anything. It's everything. Some special wrap up, but it adds like ten minutes to build time, so mm -hmm. we can do that. Uh, then, next to the whole resource, you need something to man manipulate this resource. So these are operations, and the basic operations that almost everyone uses in sees are add and remove. You say add resource, like name of resource, uh, column add or column remove. Or you can have different, which are just custom operations like uh, reload, which is a really special operation, but in general, uh, we have like some common predefined operations that everyone knows, like read resource, read resource description, and that gives you what attributes are there. So the whole resource is self-describing and tells you what is going on. So. Then we have, when it comes to operation handlers, we have like different distribution set stages when stuff can be done. The model is the part when you get opera operation comes in, you say, uh, I don't know, uh, send mail, that simple operation, it has five uh, parameters that you can take. And in the model phase, what you can do is you validate that parameters, if they're okay, if everything's fine with them, and put them in your operations. And uh, then you're done with the model. That you don't change anything else in the model phase, and then because the next phase is <coughs> runtime. What it is that the whole system takes care of if there are many operations going on at the same time, it's everything done parallel. The first thing that is that is handled is model phase for all operations, then the runtime phase for everyone, and verify the domain and then basically the the domain and then you don't do anything, you cannot register the uh, operations or do anything there. But you basically say in which stage you want to do something. In most cases, these two are important. You do some validation of the model that comes in, the, the parameters, and then runtime is actually doing whatever you want. If the operation would be called send mail, in the mail sub system, in runtime you would send mail. Operations can call operations and operations and so on and so on, and stage them in different resources and so on. Uh, we have this resource header to default on our add remove, and it's like basically what everyone does. The, the plain operation is not really that common. Uh, you do add in model, you, ch you check if everything is okay with the model, you set it, and that is what you then see in, when you're reading the resource. And in runtime, you see, okay, this is this configuration, I should probably install a service under this name that does this, to this, take this configuration or just register some deployment processors based on configuration you put in it. 
Okay, and then we have the deployment manager, which is one part of the thing. Handles the deployment repository, defines the deployment phases. Repository is where we keep all the uh, deployments that you put in. That deployment folder that you see, that's something that we actually don't like, but people like to use it because they are used to exploding their application and develop. For development, it's actually useful, but when it comes to production, especially because we have the domain mode, you, we cannot have something in summary, some folder. We need to put it in our deployment manager and make sure that it's replicated across the whole uh, domain. And that, that's why we have deployment repositories and everything is there. And that, that deployment manager also takes, defines some deployment phases where every, every subsystem can register their own operation, handles, and process, processing, and so on. And you have some management operations, deployment scanner stuff. For instance, deployment scanner is one subsystem that does nothing else but enables you to have that deployment folder that scans the folder and puts the stuff into deployment manager. That's about all it does. It's a simple subsystem. Uh, why I'm talking about deployment processor so much is because we're going to write one and see what it does. So. Any questions so far? Um, maybe no one understands me or everyone understands everything, so it's great. Uh, basically, it's kind of obvious what it does. It goes to the deployment lifecycle, you can define a order which phase and where the, to order it because maybe you want to do something after, like, web subsystem did the var processing and everything, you want to do something after that. Uh, or before that, depends what you want to do. Maybe you want to take that deployment and totally change it before it can, the uh, web subsystem or under the subsystem will deploy it and use something from it. For example, one really interesting use case for all these deployment processors and everything we see today is anyone heard about Cape Worth project? Anyone, anywhere. Uh, Cape Worth project is actually open source implementation of Google App Engine. Have everyone heard about that? Uh, and Google App, uh, the Cape Worth is implemented on the top of Butterfly, okay, AS7 on Butterfly, uh, and it's done by, done by my colleague in the same office, so I know a lot about it. And basically, the Google App Engine, if anyone that played with it knows that it has so many quirks how the stuff works, what it's allowed, what it's not allowed, and so on. And basically, what Alesh did is write three deployment processors that took, uh, took what the deployment looks like and changed it at runtime. Uh, to add different stuff so our other subsystem would handle it properly and change the behavior. Or even prevent our subsystems to do anything. Like, you cannot enable JPA for the Google App Engine applications or things like that. Because it clashes with something that Google does and have data stores and so on. It's a really, really powerful mechanism to, to completely change the, what the deployment looks like. For instance, one of the, the cool stuff in it recently is Google App Engine added support for mod modules, which is what they do is take just abuse ER packaging, and every bar inside that ER is deployed to a different server, on different uh, port, and different, completely different server. And basically, it has nothing to do with ER, but just the mechanism. So, with only deployment process and that ER was just completely changed how it's deployed, what to do in the life cycles and enable, uh, enable exactly that behavior that Google has in the Google App Engine with that. So you can hack a lot, but you have to be also careful because it can break everything for everyone else. People want to use deployment some, some, uh, also somewhere else. So basically come to the extension point, how to extend the server now. Basically, we just load all the extensions via service loader. Uh, service loader pattern just takes a look in meta-inf and the name of the service, the interface we have. If there is anything there, we load that extension. That just register the extension, doesn't do anything at that point, but just register it. And your extension has to be packaged as a JavaScript module, which is obvious. And to properly load it, you have to reference it in the configuration. If you look at standalone XML on the top, you see extension name, and there is some module extension name, there is all the extensions from JMX, JCA, under to IO, subsystem, everything is there. That is just registering the extension with the server. 
it doesn't do anything at this point. And that registration, what it does is, when the registration phase is done, your extension registers the own parser, the namespaces, and so on. And later on, when you have a configuration that matches that uh, namespace, the namespace that you register in your web service, the server boot process will just delegate that part of configuration to you. That's basically what happens. Uh, we'll take a look what is going on. Uh, so basically, this is what happens. You can send an X model, define an extension there. So we will take a look if their mo that model has any uh, extension there. Yeah, you will see in the wild flag because it's AS7 basically. We didn't go and rename all the packages or all the codes. We are doing it for new stuff, but not just go plain and search and replace everything. We did that with Maven artifacts, so that's different. But the code is still there and it's the same, unless we change it so much that it doesn't really matter to keep it compatible. And basically what happens is that it takes a little the sort of loader and find, finds that this is the class, the extension point, the entry point, and from that entry point, that's your life cycle that goes on with your extension. 